you have your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. We're going to read together that same passage that Shelby was referencing earlier. John chapter 1, starting in verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen His glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father. Full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. And from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Grace and truth. That's pretty incredible. For John's readers, the the Greek words translated grace... Charis and truth, Aletheia, would be readily recognized as a rendering of the last phrase that Shelby also referenced in Exodus chapter 34 and, and verse 6. Abounding in steadfast love, in the Hebrew it is hesed, and faithfulness, meth. So you have God's covenant keeping love that's also paired up with God's pure faithfulness. And the same glory that, that Moses just saw kind of out of the corner of his eye as he was put into the hollowed out part of the rock and he passed before him and and God describes who he is. This glory that passed, John is telling us is here and it's embodied in the flesh in Jesus Christ. And all that you've been wondering about who God is, what, what he's like, you're going to see as I tell you the Jesus story. It's here and he's full of grace and truth. What John is saying is he's going to be the embodiment of everything that's good, everything that's perfect, everything that's pleasing, everything that's wholesome, everything that is without spot or blemish. Everything we know about God is now going to be here within Jesus Christ. And he's also going to reveal God's character, his heart, his compassion, and his longing to bring all men back to him in right relationship. And so he is filled to the rim with both grace and truth. Well, some people will look at verse 17 as kind of a rejection of the law of Moses. But we know in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, that Jesus came not to do away with the law, but what? To fulfill it. So that's what we've got here. And you have the desires of God revealed in Scripture. Well, that's truth. That's what He wants for us. Along with the mercies of God, His grace, perfectly manifest in Jesus well, up, up to this point in our series on life and community, we've used one word to scriptures. If you guys remember, we, we talked about covenant and that we're a covenant body together. We also talked about how that we're kingdom. We're part of God's kingdom and we are to be seen as subjects of his on mission for the kingdom, advancing the kingdom in all that we do, whether we're at work or school, what have you. Last week, we talked about how that we're a spirit-filled com- community. Not just within us, but also collectively as a body, we have the Spirit among us. And we'll talk later on in the series about the different gifts that the Spirit brings that as we come together as one body of believers. But up at this point, we've been using one word. Today, we're going to break that pattern. We have to use two. We're going to be talking about life and community means that we're a community full of both grace and truth. Because as you'll see, you really can't have one without the other. Well, in his book, Deep and Wide, Andy Stanley, as many of you have, have heard his podcast and everything, describes life as a young minister at the church where he's on staff with his father at First Baptist Church in Atlanta. He said that in, in the early part of, of his ministry, he felt like that church at that time was for church people. He says this, No one said it, but the unspoken message to the outside world was, once you start believing and behaving like us, well, then we'll talk about it. Then you can come and join us. And he, he talked about in the book that this posture kind of left their church somewhat in an adversarial relationship with the community around them. And he said, for whatever reason, First Baptist was always boycotting something or someone. And so their community kind of knew the church, not necessarily what they were for, but you guys know the rest, what they were against. He said, in particular, their church had gotten crosswise with the gay community in Atlanta. And it came to head 
one Sunday when the organizers of the Gay Pride Day March decided to adjust their route and their schedule to where they would be marching by First Baptist Church there on, on Peach Street right as their services were letting out. Well, when the leaders of the congregation got wind that March is going to be coming by at that time, they got together, what, what are we going to do about this? They decided to let services out early, and they asked everyone to go out and exit the rear of the, of the, of the building, quickly get in their cars, hoping they would all be back in the suburbs before the first marcher came by. Well, what ended up happening? Well, everyone was so curious. They all lined Peachtree to watch the, and take in the scene as it was coming by. And Andy d- describes what he saw across the street. He said across from them was St. Mark's United Methodist Church, and they were handing out cups of cold water to the parade participants. And others were holding up signs that said, Everyone welcome. Come worship with us. God is love. He said that the contrast between the church, two churches cannot have been more pronounced. And here's my question for us. Which side of the street should we stand on? Well, the voice of truth says, well, we, we, we've got to go to Scripture. Isn't that right? And, and sure enough, I mean, if, if we look at, at Scripture, it, we're going to find out the Bible, I mean, it's right there in black and white. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 9 says, homosexual offenders will not inherit the kingdom of God. Truth is truth, like it or lump it. I, I, I wish we could be more accommodating, but I guess you'll just have to take it up with the Lord. Hold on. The voice of grace you can also look at Scripture. It's right here on the iPad. At 1 Corinthians 6 denies entrance to the kingdom of God to the greedy and the people who drink too much and wrongdoers. But besides, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 11, and that's what some of you were. So who's his audience? It's the folks that have been struggling with these various sins, including homosexual offenders. Apparently those gathered were sinners that had been introduced to the Jesus story. They had been washed in the blood of Jesus and the Holy Spirit had grabbed hold of them. To me, situations like this just kind of raise questions. It, it, it just causes you to wrestle with things. Who is the church for? Who gets to participate? Which sins, if any, disqualify a person? Is the church to welcome sinners? It, what do you do about unrepentant sinners? Uh, can you attend if you're still in the midst of kind of working some stuff out between you and God? Which side of the street would you choose to stand on? If, if you're not sure, answer this question. Which do you value more? Do you value standing up for a truth in a world that says there is no truth? It's all relative. It is whatever you want to call. Is it more important for you to stand there for truth? Or do you value more that we model the grace that each one of us craves in our own life? Which do you value more? If you ask me, it's kind of like choosing between a child, isn't it? Is it possible that both churches that day on the street were right? Is it possible that both churches on the street that day were wrong? I, I, I'm going to warn you, life in community, as, as we're describing it, is a lot easier if you'll just land on one pulpit or the other. Where it becomes messy is when you try to figure out things in between. That's when things get very difficult. You know, I, I grew up in a church that believed that church was for saved people that acted like saved people. And if you were going to be part of the community, you needed to live up to community expectations. And we were a people that based our fellowship on truth. It was important we championed it. Only thing is, if we look at some of these various lists in the Bible, of various sins, they were treated differently. See if you can resonate with this at all. There were some that we viewed that were just flat-out sins that were evidence of being unsaved. And, and there were others that were kind of described as well. well. These are kind of struggles that we all kind of wrestle with. And there were some on the list, like greed and gossip, we just kind of ignored it all together. And, and, and there were some things that we actually added to the list that weren't on the list. 
uh, because they might lead to sin. And so they were kind of elevated up to the stuff on the list. And so we spent a lot of time in youth group talking about dancing and mixed bathing and, and dreaded pantsuits. So these were the things we needed to fear because they would all lead to sin. And so this is kind of the environment I grew up in. And, and we would sing songs just as I am. O Lamb of God, I come, I come. But that's not exactly how it really was. It, it was more, you better show up at church just as you were supposed to be. If you have any conflict, if you have any struggles, if you have any doubts, you better check those at the door or at least cover them up. Of course, it made that matters worse. And people would hold it together, their family life, for as long as possible. So not letting anyone know what was going on within them so they could still remain a part of the community. Do you remember these days? And everyone would just scratch their heads when a family that was once fine, the next day dad's run off with the secretary, mom is in rehab, and, and junior is on the run from the law. And, and the leaders would get together and say, but just last week they were there on the pew when they told us they were fine. It seems the church was not for strugglers, it was for the have-it-togethers. Andy Stanley brings up a great point. He says it's hard to extend grace to people who don't seem to need it. It's hard to admit you need it when you aren't sure that you're going to receive it. But we wrestle with that because truth is truth and it can't be watered down. Amen? When we're called to do battle with those that are trying to water it down. I got to witness this firsthand uh, a few months before Jill and I got married. I was in services in a, a church in Central Texas and the preacher delivered a masterful sermon on the sin of divorce. And, and a well-meaning elder got up afterward and he had kind of his own little sermon and he explained that the next Sunday he would be at the door with an axe handle in his hand to keep out all the adulterers who committed the sin of divorce. And, and I remember thinking, well, you know, he had some pretty good scriptures to back up his point. But he kind of fell short on the whole modeling Jesus stuff. I have to tell you, the bring your friend to church day the next week was kind of a flop. You know, and, and, and many people within fellowships like this start looking, not just within ours, but in us, start looking for something else. They start looking for grace. And our grace churches is fantastic. I mean, they, they really are. Because uh, if we'll all admit that we're sinners in need of grace, then we find ourselves, that's kind of the lowest common denominator, and we all hop in the same boat, right? And it really doesn't matter what you believe or how you believe, as long as you're willing to admit, hey, it's only by the grace of God that we have any chance, right? And that sounds good, but the problem with this approach is similar to more the conservative view, is that you still have to pick and choose from various passages in the New Testament to work out this kind of theology. And, and so, all too often, truth and God's ideals are how we live or what gets lost in the shuffle. Some seem all right with that, though. We think about it, truth as such an absolute tone to it. And, and how can you be tolerant and open to your friends if we're constantly bringing up holy standards that, that all of us struggle to meet anyways? And, and in fact, if we'll just kind of shelf this whole sin thing, then we really can do away this whole call to change thing as well. Who needs discipleship when you have a Savior? I can just be me and do my thing knowing that I've got Jesus' love and the grace of God to cover over everything. But if we read in Scripture, Jesus kind of modeled a different way, a different way of doing things. And so that's what I want to look at this morning because John points to, to something a little different in the way that Jesus did. Jesus was able to hold both grace and truth and tension with one another. Not half doses of each where you kind of say, well, on this, we're going to extend a little bit of grace. Well, on this, we're going to come down hard on truth. No, he was the full measure of both at the same time. It's very hard to do. So it's a complete embodiment of both. If you remember the story in John chapter 8 of the woman caught in the act of adultery, and we, you, you know this story. If you don't, come by, and I'll, I'll talk with you a little bit about it. But basically, a, a woman has been brought before Jesus, and she's been caught 
red-handed. We don't know what happened to the guy, but she's been dropped there in the, in the, in the foot of, of Jesus and asked, Lord, what are we going to do with her? Well, the text says you've got to stone her. Is that the truth that Jesus played out? Well, instead, what Jesus ends up doing, instead of handing down a death sentence, he hands her a lifeline. He says to the woman, if no one is here to condemn you, then neither do I. And the grace folks are like going, yes, Jesus, love that. But what does he follow that up? Now go now and leave your life of sin. See, in, in these statements that, that, that go together, he's, watering, he's not watering down truth or allowing it to be dismissed, but nor is he condi- giving conditional grace. He's lifting up both. I love the story in, in Luke chapter 19 of Zacchaeus. And grace comes first in this story as well. As he's walking through town, going into Jericho, and he sees the despised tax collector up in, up, up, up in the tree asking him to come down. It was an act of grace, according to the crowd, just for him to walk into his doors. I don't know what was discussed at dinner, but it wasn't an endorsement for Zacchaeus to continue on with his shady business practices. No, when Zacchaeus runs head on into the grace of God, he also pursues the truth of God. And he starts questioning his life and looking at it saying, if I have seen the love and, and grace that's been offered by Jesus Christ, this is a God I want to pursue. Starts looking at himself and he's like, hey, if, uh, I'm going to give half my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated any of you that are out there that are watching this whole scene, I'm going to repay it fourfold. It's grace and truth. In Jesus, there was no conflict between grace and truth. And neither should there be in our church. The purpose of truth isn't to isolate people from God, nor to keep them out of the church. You know, I really have no desire to be part of a church that's doctrinally sound, but not willing to reach out and love people like Jesus did. But nor am I willing to be a part of a grace community that's untethered from the truth. We're just kind of, everyone come and do their own thing and let's gloss over and endorse worldly lifestyles. You know, when we just diminish the destructiveness of sin in our lives and we pursue a path other than what God's calling us to, we also diminish the power and the need for the cross. Because it, it's pointed for us to, pro, to proclaim that we're, we're, we're all forgiven if we're not willing to say this is what we're forgiven from in the first place. We've got to recognize both in our lives. You know, I've set the, the stage up here to where it kind of looks like this is a pair, you know, this is kind of a, it's either one or the other, but in reality, it's both. We're called to embrace both grace and truth. It's not one end of the spectrum or the other. Both ingredients are necessary if we truly are going to life and community together. Here's a couple action steps, and well, the lesson is yours. Number one, we have to figure out grace and truth as we're relating to others. You know, we need to do our best to live, live according to God's plans and God's ideals that are revealed in Scripture and also re- revealed in life of Christ. But we've also got to graciously live like the Word, Jesus Christ, lived. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and warn you. That when the church holds fast to truth and God's teaching and Scripture, People are going to throw it out to us and they're going to point to us and it's going to bring about opposition. And traditionally, when it's brought about opposition, when we stand firm on something and, and people call us judgmental, well, kind of our go-to phrase, see if you can help me fill out this. We're, we're talking about a, what do we do to the sinner? Love the sinner and we... I think sometimes... People on the other end of this say, you've come to grips with your own sin, but you hate my sin. I wonder if we can't change this to something different. What if we're a fellowship of believers that say we're here to help the sinner through the sin? That We'll take people where they are. That we're all in this boat together as sinners in the need of God's mercy. And we're just looking for one more 
No matter what you're wrestling with, we want to accept you where you are so that Jesus can help both of us get to where we need to be. Not lowering standards, but admitting that we need God's grace to get there. What if grace and truth started spilling over into each of our relationships? What if it spilled over into our marriages? You know, doing our best to live according to God's standards in our marriage and, and husbands loving their wife as, as Christ loved the church. And what, what if we're doing the, the best we can, but yet we're not extending grace to our mate? Well, that's, that's got to change. People have got to see that we're different in our, the way that we relate with one another within our marriages. What about in raising kids? I'm, I'm going to tell you the secret to raising good, good children. It's when you have high expectations that are also married with high love and support. Don't lower the standards for, for your children. Raise them according to God's word and expect them to do tremendous things that they've been gifted. Tell them about using their gifts out to advance the kingdom. But we also got to support them, love and encourage them and give them abundance of grace and mercy. What about on the job? What about instead of looking at, at working for your boss, that you're working for your heavenly Father. And so you're doing the best you can to, to live according to God's standards and to view work as a blessing like Scripture talks about. And so you, you're holding up truth as best you can. But those that you're working with, maybe that are under you, you're modeling this truth in your life, but you're extending grace to those that need it. What about within the church? Sometimes the hardest people to extend grace to are those that you disagree with and then family of God. We'll talk about this more as we're talking about unity in the next few weeks. We've got to, if we're going to get the word out, we've got to be modeling grace within these walls. I want to encourage you this week to find one relationship that maybe you have either not been living according to truth or you've not been extending grace in that relationship and, and try to do both in that. But secondly, I think we have to figure out grace and truth when in, in relating to God. You know, most people that I talk with that are struggling spiritually usually have one or the other of these out of balance in their life as they begin talking and sharing their story. For, for those that ha have gone to the well and drink deeply from God's grace, praise be the Lord. Praise be the Lord. But your grace that you're receiving should drive you to truth is not to allow you to stay in your current position and just continue to go on sinning. I want us to read the passage that the praise team read earlier from Titus chapter 2 and verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It's fantastic. But it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. It's both when we say we love grace and we, we celebrate that and sing about that, does mean that that's an exchange for the truth that's laid out in Scripture and laid out and modeled by Jesus Christ in His life. For those of you that have spent the majority of your life on the truth side, I want to encourage you that the truth of God and everything that we see in that and the teaching of the Sermon on the Mount is supposed to drive us to God. It's supposed to drive us to Him and say, we can't measure up to this. It's, and so, unless we can absorb that with a full dose of the grace of God, sometimes we become hard on ourselves. We're willing to extend grace and, and forgiveness and mercy to others. Somehow, we can't do it. We can't, we can't extend that same grace to ourselves. And sometimes, we can't trust that God has enough forgiveness to cover over our sins. That somehow the work of the cross, as, as magnificent as it was, it just wasn't enough because God could see my heart and, and can see that I have not lived up to his standards. My, my life has been a disappointment to God. And God says, it's enough. It's enough. Albert Barnes puts it this way. All true believers receive from Christ's fullness. All of us receive Christ's fullness. Listen to what we get. The best and the greatest saints cannot live without that fullness. And the meanest and the weakest may live by Him. 
That's good news. And that's the message that we've got to get out to our community. That's the message we've got to take to our schools. That's the message we've got to take to the person in the cubicle next to us. It's good news. We've got to trust in God. We've got to trust in his promises. When people come into our fellowship, they need to observe that we have a high and a conservative view of God's work and the teachings of Jesus. But they also have to see that we have a liberal helping of God's grace and his mercy. Let's pray together. Father, as, as we assemble here this morning, as followers of your, you, Lord, we admit that, that we're troubled by the morals of society and how they continue to decline in our schools, in our neighborhoods, work, in Washington, all over this country and around this world, we can see things eroding. And we know, Lord, that's because people are not following after you. And if they knew you, they knew your heart. And if, if, if they understood that you have a different way of living, this world would be so much better. Lord, help us not to keep pace and just to be one arm lengths away from the ways and the teachings of this world. Help us to stand firm with the truth that you presented to us. Lord, we also hate to see the decline of your church being a voice within this community. And Lord, forgive us if our action, our treatment of outsiders have, have, have helped precipitate this sidelining of the church. Lord, I pray that each of us can truly be a community filled to the rim with Jesus' truth that he embodied. And Lord, fill us to the rim with the grace that he extended. Help us to be your people. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.